So we didn't get to do the children's message today, but I'm going to share with you the book I was going to read anyway. Spur of the moment decision, but it's a really good one. It's called God's Dream, and it's by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Douglas Carlton Abrams. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest of dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires or being treated like a full person, no matter how young you might be? Do you know what God dreams about? If you close your eyes and look with your heart, I am sure, dear child, that you will find out God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hands and play one another's games and laugh with one another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that when we get angry and hurt one another, soon we start to feel sad and feel so very alone. Sometimes we cry, and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and we forgive one another, we wipe away our tears, and God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us, and when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters, yes, even you and me, even if we have different mommies and daddies or live in different faraway lands, even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God, even if we have different eyes or different skin, even if you are taller and I am smaller, even if your nose is little and mine is larger. Dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It's really quite easy. As easy as sharing, loving, caring, as easy as holding, playing, laughing, as easy as knowing we are family because we are all God's children. Dear child of God, will you help God's dream come true? I guess I could say that I've always been a little bit of a dreamer. As a kid, I remember my mom encouraging me. She would say, dream big and always have a plan B. So when I wanted to be a famous singer and an actor on Broadway, she encouraged me to take lessons and audition for musicals and also made sure I did my math homework. When I pretended to be the Wizard of Oz and make magic potion out of my melted vanilla ice cream so that I could become invisible and get out of cleaning my room, my mom played along for a little while she encouraged me to dream and then made sure that I knew when the magic potion had worn off. Maybe you were a dreamer once too, but I wonder, at what point do we stop dreaming? When we're younger, maybe it's easier to let our imagination take the lead with less responsibility and worry. But as we get older and experience more of the world, our ability to dream and imagine can become quite daunting. Perhaps our dreams become more practical in nature than they once were, and we stop seeing ourselves as we once did as Wizard of Oz or Broadway singer. We could say that's part of growing up, but I also think it takes creative energy to dream, am I right? And sometimes with age, we may get a little tired of that. Well, that's one reason today that I'm thankful for our scripture. 
that continues to inspire us and by its very nature invites each of us, you and me, to keep up with our dreaming. Paul would agree, you know, the church needs you to dream. And the church needs us to dream together and to do so boldly, with fear, without fear, and with faith. Because, friends, when we dream, we also remember that the story of our beloved church didn't die on the cross with Jesus. Instead, it was reimagined with him in the resurrection and is still alive today. In the opening of his prayer for the community of Ephesus, Paul emphasizes the ways that the people are united in their human kindness under God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. This is such a beautiful part of this story because it's not just a dream for Paul, but Paul believes that this is his reality, that the church is rooted and grounded in the love of Christ and therefore has the power to make dreams come true, especially God's dream. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. This dream for Christ Church is indeed a new reality. The people of God who have been cut off from the temple of the Lord, who have been outcast, forbidden to enter, excommunicated, and refused access to God's love. Those who have suffered great loss, who have died, and those who are still living are all one in Christ Jesus. And we participate in this fullness of God with all the saints because Christ who gave up himself for us unites all of us into one body of faith the body of our Lord, doing his work from generation to generation. With this dream in his heart and in his mind, Paul prays for the church of Christ, that we would soon understand our unique identity as the temple for our Lord, that we might understand that we, are the dwelling place for God in the world. Wherever we go, that God goes before us, no longer far off, available and accessible for only a select few who could read and interpret the scripture, but God goes with us to be the church in the world, communicating God's most essential attribute for the people, and that is love. I'll just name that I know it's often easier said than done. To love each other, to show God's love out in the world. So do I expect you to leave here today going across the street, ranting and raving, waving your arms and saying, God loves you, don't you know that? God is love. No, of course not. The Wells preacher already has that covered. But what we're called to do when we leave here each week, friends, is to share the abundant love of God in Christ Jesus with our very lives. We live Christ's dream when we leave worship each week and make his love known and available in the loving relationships we share. That's what makes all the difference in the world. When relationships are built on Christ's love. You know as well as I do that running around camp campus like a crazy person, person, shouting about God's love and looking like a fool, will not get the message of God's love across. 
But when we leave these four walls, whether at work, at home, in your neighborhoods, in our own parking lot, for heaven's sake, on a mission trip or at a soup kitchen, these are places where relationships are made. And these are the places where God's love is put into action. Remember that because God dwells in you, so also does God's love, which isn't meant to be kept in secret, but to be shared beyond our ability to understand or imagine. As I studied and prepared for the sermon this week, you may be interested to know that I learned the word love or agape in Greek, which means unconditional love, is used 20 times in this letter to the Ephesians. 20 times. 10 times as a noun and 10 times as a verb. And for such a short letter, I mean, go look it up later. That is a lot of love. And I think it provides quite a balanced image for us of God's unconditional love as both, what is a noun? Person, place, or thing, and as a verb, action. The image Paul uses to describe the church is of being rooted and grounded in love. Any of you gardeners out there will like this image, like a tree that plants its roots in good soil, so that when it's fed and nourished, it continues to grow and bear much fruit. This is part of God's dream that the people of God would be rooted and grounded in love, and like a tree, continue to grow from generation to generation, sharing fruit that nourishes the people. So the question I'm wondering today is how might we continue living God's dream as the people of God? As a noun? and as a verb? And how might our dreaming contribute to, as Paul writes, the power already at work within us, able to accomplish abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine? And I wonder, how might we actively seek to share this love that we have already received in Christ Jesus? And I wonder, if given permission to dream without judgment or fear, what exactly would you dream for yourself, for your family, for our beloved church? In God's house, hear this, there are no dreams too great or too small. Some might say the problem with dreaming is that it makes us vulnerable. And I say that's the beauty of it. It's true that dreaming with Jesus may expose us to the possibility of failure, to the opinions of others that may not match up with our own. But more than that, friends, more than that, dreaming with Jesus creates open doors of possibility and open minds for immeasurable growth, and open hearts to the countless blessing that comes when we decide that we want to live like the resurrection truly matters today. So what are you dreaming? How do you envision the story of our beloved church being told from generation to generation? While you think about it, I'll share with you some of my dreams. Well, believe it or not, and you know I only tell the truth, I dreamed of pastoring among a campus community in recent years. Dreams come true, you know. Since before we were married, I've dreamed that one day Bryn and I will become parents. 
I believe that dreams come true, you know. Heck, I've even always dreamed that one day I'd memorize all of the names of the 66 books in the Bible in order. And I'm 33 and I'm almost halfway there, so I think that's a good record. Do you have dreams? I hope you do. Because you're never too small or too tall. Continue dreaming with Jesus. Write them down. Remember them. So that you can come back to them and see how God continues to make dreams come true. Thanks be to God. Amen.